Right, okay. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is about, um, this is a brief overview about what is the menopause, but we're going to be focusing really on the treatments for menopause and menopausal symptoms. So this is like a brief overview. So um, the menopause is fundamentally the ending of fertility, um, which means we're unable to conceive any more children, and it's the ending of our menstrual cycles. Um, it's about changes in our hormone levels. So our hormone levels start to take a nosedive when our ovaries aren't producing eggs anymore and therefore our estrogen levels take go really, really low. So it's changes to our hormone levels. So that's estrogen, progesterone and testosterone as well, which is about the deficiency. Now, the deficiency in the hormones is what it causes the menopausal symptoms that we identify so easily. Um, and this is about the deficiency, and that's a really important fact. Um, it's about the deficiencies in hormones that causes the menopausal symptoms. Um, the physical effects of the um, menopausal symptoms are the vasomotor, such as hot flushes, your night sweats, but there's lots of psychological factors that are really important. And the psychological factors can really impact on our well-being more than the physical ones. Um, and, you know, that's things like anxiety, lack of confidence, um, and they can really take a nose dive. So people that were normally super fit, confident at doing their work, find it incredibly difficult um, to function each day. And, and, you know, and obviously this has like a massive impact on your ability to work and live a happy, normal life again. Um, when when does the menopause start um, and when does the menopause end? So the menopause can start really when you're in your, I normally sort of like when you're in your 40s, generally your late 40s, um, and it, the, the symptoms of menopause can continue for some women up until the 70s and their 80s. Uh, but the reality is that most women find that in sort of like their early 60s, the classical symptoms of menopause for the majority of women um, end at that point, or they certainly reduce. And uh, what is hormone replacement therapy? Well, this is basically what it is. It's replacing the hormones that you're now deficient in. Thank you, Tammy. Um, and why treat the menopausal symptoms? Well, I, and this is something that obviously I discuss with people in quite some length, particularly when I'm doing presentations like this, um, because people are saying to me, well, you know, I'm 52. I haven't got any symptoms of menopause. So why on earth do I need to do or consider HRT? Well, um, the reason that I get a bit of concerned, really, when people say that they feel fine or, as I said, you know, oh, I've sailed through the menopause or my mom went through the menopause and she didn't take any HRT. So why should I do anything about it? Well, the fact that we're deficient in oestrogen, that deficiency is going to be there. Now, we might not be experiencing too many symptoms at that particular time. It's a little bit like the iceberg scenario. So what you can see on the surface are your physical and psychological symptoms. But it's what's going on internally that I'm probably more concerned about, because what's going on internally is that the deficiency in these hormones can have quite a significant impact on your heart, your blood vessels and your bones. Um, and so when people say that they haven't got any symptoms, so I don't need to talk to them about menopause. Menopause isn't anything that's affected them, um, that they're fine. They don't want to even think about HRT because they, they, they feel absolutely great. They may be feeling really good, but the re, like I said, the reality is that what is going on internally, because every woman will experience the menopause, every woman will go through the menopause and they will all have the ovaries failing, whether it's from a hysterectomy um, or from um, a natural menopause. So when their ovaries fail, they stop producing estrogen, they'll be experiencing the effect of estrogen deficiency. And that has a huge impact on our bodies internally. Um, and then often people are saying to me, well, you know, 100 years ago, people didn't used to have HRT. So I'm certainly not going to take it. Taking HRT or not is basically it is a personal choice. And it's important that health professionals like myself that understand about menopause, educate people and just give people a really balanced view um, so you can make the right decision for you. But years ago, um, no, there wasn't any HRT. 
Um, and people did just have to get on with it. But about 100 years ago, things were slightly different uh, as far as health was concerned, because life expectancy for women was probably sort of like in their, in their sort of like late 50s, early 60s. So that was your life expectancy. Um, and so if you were only living maybe five or six years being postmenopausal, then um, it really didn't affect you too much. And women had a later menopause. So approximately 100 years ago, um, women didn't actually complete the menopause until their late 50s, uh, rather than now in their early 50s. So we are living a lot longer being postmenopausal. And what we're saying now is that our children will be spending probably half of their lives being postmenopausal. So the effect of estrogen deficiency for half of your life is going to have a significant impact on your um, internal health. So although years ago women used to just get on with it, of course they did, but they didn't live that much longer being postmenopausal and therefore they didn't have the effects of osteoporosis um, and um, heart disease. Obviously life was very different then. We probably didn't have these significant issues or we certainly didn't understand it then, but we do now. And natural um, doesn't mean safe. This is um, a common thing that people say to me that, you know, you're putting all these chemicals into my body, but the reality is that they're not chemicals as such the hormones that we're replacing are like for like they're replacing the chemicals uh, sorry the chemicals the hormones that you're deficient in and giving you back that exact hormone just in a slightly different pharmaceutical way but we're actually giving you back that hormone and so when people say that they don't want hrt because it's it's unnatural and it's unsafe um, and it's just a whole load of chemicals. That's that's incorrect and that is misleading in itself. Um, and things that you can buy from the health food shops, the, the problems associated with these is that unless the person that's advising you to get this or um, or, or you're buying it from the, the, the natural supplements that may help some menopausal symptoms, unless they're being um, advised or prescribed by a fully registered traditional medical herbalist who understand that the um, how interactions with traditional medications HRT and health conditions have um, then they can advise you on herbal medicine that would work well for you but as we know people don't go to to see these health professionals they'll go to the health shop or, or just buy something online but there's no understanding that they actually work. In fact, that the evidence to, as to date is very inconclusive. There are a few herbal things that they believe may help, but it certainly won't be as good as hormone replacement therapy. So natural doesn't mean safe. Um, and sometimes it's it's far from it. Um, and so it's really getting a really good understanding of, of what that really means and how it's implying to you. There's lots of horror stories and the fear around HRT. I, I hear it and read about it every single day. And this can come from health professionals, um, from ladies that I see, things that you read about as well. And so really it's, it's for people like myself in presentations such as this that we get the right message across. And it's about giving fact, evidence based facts on the latest research and discussing it and then whatever choices we make it's based on evidence and then we are, we can make any choices that we want to for our own health but at least we know deep down that we're doing the right thing for us thank you tammy okay and the um the fear factor so where does this come from where does it originate from well years and years ago um women were prescribed hrt um, and people were taking it and having really good results from it. But um, in 2002, the Women's Health Initiative, which is an American study, um, was, was doing a massive, massive study on, on hormone replacement therapy. And basically they, um, they started to realize there were some quite serious things happening that they weren't happy about. They started to look at the evidence and they realized that there was a, there was a high proportion of women developing um, breast cancer from taking HRT. So the study was probably about half, three quarters, three quarters of the way through. 
and they just abruptly stopped it, um, information was published to the media and to medical journals saying that HRT caused an increase in breast cancer. And it was a little bit like an overnight, something, everything changed, everything altered. GP stopped prescribing it. It was all in the medical journals about um, the, the alarming risk factors associated with HRT. Women got really frightened. It was headline news of all the, all the, all the tabloids. And women just panicked. GPs wouldn't prescribe it anymore. And everybody just abruptly stopped taking HRT. And then shortly after that, the Million Women study was published, which basically sort of agreed with what the Women's Health Initiative study was saying as well. But what they didn't go into details with, and this is what's come out years and years later, is that, first of all, there was an awful lot of really good evidence that came out of the Women's Health Initiative. So that's something really positive. And even now, we're still utilising parts of this research because they were massive research articles. But um, they found we found out that the reason that there was a higher incidence of breast cancer, one of the reasons was because the trial was being put um, used on um, American women in their sort of mid 60s were started on HRT. They were given maybe the more unsafe parts or unsafe types of HRT. So these were older women. Most of them had different health effects, such as they smoked, they drank a lot of alcohol, they were overweight. So as we know, smoking, getting older and being overweight increases your risks of developing any form of cancer. Cancer affects people as we get older, the, the, our risks increase. So that was the one thing that they didn't discuss. And that's the one thing to come out of that Williams Women's Health Initiative, that the research was flawed heavily heavily flawed and the majority of this has now been dismissed as, as just we're not going to take a lot of notice of this but they have extrapolated quite a lot of information and they've done different types of research since then so sorry that's a little bit heavy but this is where it all stemmed from and HRT prescribing literally just stopped at that point and it's only really been probably the last five years or so that things have really started to, we've been talking about it more, prescribing it more, learning about it more. So that's really where it came from. And health professionals, you know, health professionals back then uh, were prescribing it quite happily. They then stopped. And menopause training and menopause support literally has been virtually non-existent. There have been a very small um, areas that have been doing some menopause support but it's not something that's discussed a lot there isn't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of health professionals doing it um, and so there's a lot of GPs in general practice that are just putting their hands up going I don't do menopause or I don't do anything to do with women's health which really is absolutely not acceptable at all and it's their own personal beliefs about it I mean it's, it's a massive massive issue and lots and lots of thoughts around this but you know um why is the lack of training around it why aren't health professionals why aren't gps learning more about menopause when 51 percent of the population are women and every single woman will it will go through the menopause um so it's something that really needs to be addressed the fear comes from a lot of family and friends oh you know um, my um my family or somebody says i shouldn't take it because it will kill me or give me cancer and it gave me this problem or I've been told never to take it. So when you listen to family and friends, it's fine to listen to family and friends, particularly if there are like hereditary factors there that may be cause for concern. But this is the kind of thing that you do need to be speaking to health professionals to find out if this is something you can take or not. Because with a lack of understanding about medicine and health, it can lead you to put two and two and, and forming seven instead of four. But when you speak to somebody that understands menopause, they'll be able to dispel those myths and tell you what's happening in the media. Um, and really just sort of like, you know, giving women the right advice and the right support. And there are lots of issues associated with cultural beliefs as well um, around the menopause. And people think that, you know, um, they don't want to take it um, because um, it isn't something that's done in their culture and certainly menopause isn't discussed and HRT isn't prescribed. It's very much a case of just getting on with it, really. Um, and this can cause, obviously, many women to be suffering unnecessarily. Thank you, Tammy.
So HRT, so why take it? Um, I think from, from my point of view, it's really thinking about what's going on internally due to the estrogen deficiency. And as I said in one of the first slides, estrogen deficiency, this is a very, very important part. And this is something if nothing else that you take about when you're thinking about menopause. Menopause and the symptoms of menopause um, fundamentally come from um, hormone deficiencies. So when we're giving you HRT, HRT is just replacing those hormones. So the hormones that your um, ovaries are no longer producing, such as the estrogen, the type of estrogen that you're now deficient in, um, your body, um, your body isn't producing it anymore. The HRT is actually giving you back that estrogen. So it's like for like replacing it. And we call this um, regulated bioidentical HRT. It's a bit of a long word. We don't generally refer to these words, this terminology, because we just call it HRT, hormone replacement therapy. And our attitudes towards HRT is one of those things that people don't like to admit about it. They don't like to talk about it. It's a source of embarrassment or shame that, you know, that you've, you, you weren't strong enough as a person to, to, to carry on feeling dreadful. Um, and you sort of like you buckled and you succumbed to, um, you know, you were weak and you decided that you, you, you were, at the end of the day, you had to take HRT. It's really changing that viewpoint and those perceptions associated with HRT. And, you know, slowly, slowly with, with talks like this and the right word getting out, it's not about as a last resort and being a failure that you're having to go on to it. It's actually being very sensible and thinking, well, I understand what's going on in my body. Therefore, I'm doing the right thing for me and it's my choice and I'm going to go on this and I'm going to reap the benefits from the reduction in the symptoms, but improving my long term health as well. So, you know, slowly, slowly, we've got to start to change these attitudes and perceptions and talk about it. And I'll freely admit that, you know, that I take HRT and I prescribe it on a daily basis. Um, and the people that I have prescribed it to um, have got the benefits of taking it as well. And, and so it's really about understanding what HRT is about and how it's actually working. So what we prescribe is called regulated bioidentical HRT. Long word, don't worry about it. That's just the official term for it. Um, it's about being safe and the safety of it. There are certain types of HRT and certain routes of HRT that are fundamentally safer for the majority of women. The safest and the best possible way of receiving your oestrogen is through a patch or a gel, what we call transderm, also being absorbed via the skin. And um, this comes in patches and gels and sprays. Um, and so that's probably the best way of getting it. And the way it works is that it absorbs through the skin and it goes into the blood vessels directly and the blood cells attach onto it and they then distribute the oestrogen to all the parts of the body. We have oestrogen receptor cells everywhere. We have them in the brain, we have them in the ligaments, we have them in our heart, we have them in our stomach, um, and we have them in our skin. So when we start to give our body HRT, then basically these cells in the body latch onto it and they distribute it everywhere. Vaginal oestrogen, this is something that's really important because there's a, a condition called um, a urine, urogenital, urinary, oh gosh, I can't say the word. Um, it's a vaginal atrophy, u, urinary, genital urinary syndrome of menopause, sorry. Um, and this is a condition that affects women during the menopause in which the cells in the vagina become deficient in oestrogen and they can have a really significant impact on our sexual health. It can give us frequent urinary tract infections. It can cause vaginal dryness, vaginal itch. It can actually cause the opposite, like an increased discharge as well. Uh, but women find that sex is incredibly uncomfortable, if not impossible. The skin can tear, split, bleed. The, the labia can actually stick together. Um, and it makes women's um, sort of the genital system, it can become exposed. The actual cells um, degenerate, they change, the skin can look pale. Um, you can have dry skin problems, itching skin problems. Um, and sometimes this can lead to more significant health concerns. 
Now, due to the lack of estrogen all over our body, but predominantly in the vaginal area as well, that the symptoms of vaginal uh, dryness because of the lack of estrogen can be very significant. And so if any women out there are experiencing symptoms of frequent urinary tract infections, cystitis, painful sex, it feels rather dry down below, uncomfortable to wear tight clothing or to sit, you really need to be discussing this with the GP because you can have what we call localised oestrogen, um, which is taken vaginally and this feeds the cells inside the vagina, the vulva, the whole of the pelvic floor, the bladder, the urethra. So the whole of that system are suddenly given oestrogen and it improves their appearance, the feel, everything feels better again. So vaginal oestrogen is incredibly important. The amount of vaginal estrogen absorbed around the body is incredibly low, low to virtually nothing. Um, so it's just being aware that you can have normal HRT and you can have vaginal estrogen as well. Um, I hear lots of women say to me that they couldn't have uh, vaginal estrogen and systemic estrogen, HRT, but you can. And regulated compounded bioidentical HRT, long mouthful. But this is these um, special clinics that you can go to, these very expensive private clinics that um, often take mouth swabs and they say that they're going to make HRT uh, very naturally um, and it's based on, on your molecular structure and things like this. Um, they are unregulated uh, practices and therefore they're not deemed safe. Um, and it causes me a lot of concern when I hear people have gone to places um, such as these because what they need to be doing is getting regulated hormone replacement therapy um, that we know is safe. It's been researched for years and years and years. The thing is with these unregulated establishments is that we don't understand what's in them. We don't know what it is that they're receiving and therefore we don't know if it's giving you a um, good safe profile for hormone replacement. Um, so who can't have HRT? Well, there are very few women that can't have HRT, but predominantly it's women that are undergoing active breast cancer treatment or active hormonal cancers at that particular time. Um, I can't quite see my screen. Tell me, can you tell me what the last one says? Cancer. Yeah, yeah, it just says cancer links, Diane. Yeah, so again, we've okay. talked about this. So people that are having active hormonal cancers at the time, wouldn't be able to have HRT, certainly if you're undergoing particular treatments at the time, but it may be that when you speak to your specialist afterwards that you can have um, HRT. Thank you. It's about improving your quality of life. I mean, I do consultations on with women all the time and they're telling me that they feel really low, they, uh, they can't barely leave the house sometimes. They feel that they want to um, reduce their hours at work, that they're not sleeping. The relationship with their partner is really strained. They just want to be alone. They don't know where they've gone to. They just feel lost. Um, and I hear this on a, a regular basis. And so hormone replacement therapy improves your quality of life. Not for everybody, but for the majority of women, hormone replacement therapy makes people feel an awful lot better. It helps the physical symptoms and the psychological effects of it, which ultimately means if you're sleeping better, your bones and your joints aren't aching as much, um, you feel happier in yourself, your skin's not so dry and itchy, uh, you find that your nails and your hair are looking better, and um, you just start to feel a lot better in yourself. You know, you're not feeling as anxious, you're coping with work better, you're remembering things again, obviously brain fog is a significant problem, then um, all this is going to impact on your quality of life and you will start to feel better. You'll start to feel like the old you again, which is something that um, you know women are always telling me, I don't know where I've gone, I'm not there anymore. Um, and so really this is what HRT does, it improves your quality of life. And for the long-term health, it's about replacing the hormones so that we've got more, um, you've got the benefits against heart disease, osteoporosis, and there are links that it helps prevent against Alzheimer's as well. Um, and because we're living longer postmenopausal now, again, you know, most women are going into menopause in sort of like their early 50s, and we're living into our 80s, 90s. Uh, we're spending so much of our time being postmenopausal. 
all this is going to have to have a significant impact on our quality of life and on our physical health. So that's why replacing the hormones you're deficient in is going to protect your heart, protect your bones, so you can stay active, happier, healthy for a lot longer. And how long can you stay on it for? Well, <laughs> Um, it, they used, there used lots of things been bandied around about this. I mean, they, years ago, they used to say you stay on it for five years. The reality is that you stay on it for as long as the benefit of taking it outweighs any risk factors for you. Um, you know, I know people in their 80s that take HRT. So it really is a very much a personal choice. And it's something that you discuss with your prescriber. But um, if you're fit and you're healthy, you have no particular health concerns at all then the reality is that you can stay on HRT long term. So um, when can you stop it? Well, again, you stop it if there's um, significant risk factors there or um, you've been diagnosed with something, a, a certain type of cancer, which means that you can't use it or you're having particular treatments um, that means you can't take HRT. Um, but you, you don't have to stop it necessarily for any other reasons. You would talk to your um, health professional um, about this but you can continue taking it sort of like into your 60s 70s 80s if your health and if it's your choice um, whether you want to take it or not and people often say to me but if I just take HRT won't it just delay the menopause well this is all about understanding what's going on in the body um, our ovaries have stopped producing eggs our ovaries have shut down they're no longer producing estrogen so whether you have HRT or not, nothing is going to make your ovaries produce estrogen again. Nothing whatsoever. This is about replacing the hormones so that you're not getting the symptoms associated with estrogen deficiency, like your flushes and your sweats and your anxiety. But also it's about protecting our long term health. So there is no such thing about delaying the menopause. The menopause happens to us all and that's it. And no amount of HRT is going to make your ovaries spring back to life and produce estrogen again. That's just not going to happen. And Tammy, I can't see the last one. Oh, what is testosterone replacement, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Well, we produce loads of testosterone um, from our ovaries as well. So when our ovaries fail and we stop producing estrogen, we stop producing testosterone as well. Um, and testosterone replacement is something that I'm prescribing more and more these days. The more people understand the importance of it, the more women are going on to estrogen and, and progesterone, the more they're saying to me, oh, you know, do I need some testosterone? And I do consultations about that because testosterone deficiency can impact on your cognitive health. Uh, your um, your um, muscles, it makes your brain work better and it just generally lifts you. It feels like you've got that spring in your step again. So don't underestimate testosterone and it's not that you're going to start to grow body hair and things, which some people are saying to me, um, it's not like that at all. It's an important female hormone that we mustn't forget about. Thank you, Tammy. So who can help me? Well, I think the first person to talk to is your GP about, um, about menopause symptoms and whether um, you'd like some hormone replacement therapy or not. But again, you need to be making work aware of this as well. Obviously, you don't have to discuss everything with your employer. But if, it's, if you find that you're struggling with your work, it is important that you make them aware of it. But you've got to talk to your doctor about it as well because everything just fits in together. Because if something did happen, and your performance was reduced because of your menopausal symptoms, it's important to demonstrate to your employer that you are actively seeking help and you're getting support for this so that you can improve your symptoms. So therefore, there's a reason for it that's being investigated and the doctor will talk to you about menopause. So talking to your wellbeing teams, occupational health, HR, your manager, it is important if you are finding that you're struggling particularly like the, the um, occupational health and the wellbeing teams. But HR, you know, where's, where's the menopause policy in your place of work? And if you are struggling with menopausal symptoms, there should be something there within the policy that's showing how you can be supported within the workplace. And it's about seeking um, help and advice from health providers who do specialise in menopause. Um, 
because these are these are the health professionals that understand menopause um, HRT better than anybody else. Family and friends, again, it's talking to people because we know that talking is very good to improve our symptoms and talking just makes you feel better as well. So it's about discussing, um, you know, maybe they've been on HRT, maybe they didn't. What are their thoughts and beliefs on menopause? How did they deal with stress and anxiety? How did they cope with in the workplace? And it's just getting tips and advice from, from people that we're closest to. You know, we can read some things on social media, but do be very, very selective with what you're reading. Um, there's some uh, quite interesting things, as we know, on social media. But there are some sites that are actually very interesting and very good. Um, so it's a case of just looking at them. But the NICE guidelines are one of the most important documents that we need to be referring to, particularly if you're going to be speaking to our GP about menopause. If we can just have a look at the NICE guidelines, they guide health professionals on every aspect of health. And menopause is included in that. Um, and it's um, it's um, the national guideline number 23 is what you need to be referring to. And those are the NICE guidelines on menopause and also looking at the British Menopause Society website as well. So HRT, does it help everybody? Well, um, a lot of people tell me that they've been to see the doctor and they weren't confident whatsoever in, in the person that prescribed to them. Now, the problem we've got is that you're seven minutes with your GP. And if you've got lots of anxiety, which you're probably going to have because you're menopausal, then being in and out of the GP practice is quite problematic in itself because you're there for such a short time. A lot of women say to me that they don't feel they've been listened to, that their main concerns have been addressed. They feel rushed and hurried um, and that they're wondering if the prescription for HRT or antidepressants, etc., was was the right thing for them. And a lot of it comes down to the GP's lack of training, the GP's lack of understanding. And it's the lack of time you're spending with the doctor when you feel rushed and hurried and, un, uh, and you haven't been listened to. It knocks your confidence even more. And lots of women tell me that they've got a prescription for HRT from their GP, but they haven't taken it because they're too worried to take it because they haven't got the reassurance. It hasn't been explained to them as it should have been. And it's about your own personal views um, and also the doctor's personal views about HRT as well, because lots of doctors won't prescribe HRT. Excuse me, they prescribe um, antidepressants instead. And because their attitude towards HRT is from um, uh, the, the myths back in the um, from the 2002 million women's and the Women's Health Initiative study. They haven't actually maybe updated as they should have been um, to the more up to date evidence to discuss that HRT is, is, is better. And also the NICE guidelines are there to support the use of HRT for the majority of women. If it's written in the NICE guidelines, then that's important. And that's what health professionals need to be adhering to. Um, and again, you know, the doctors may not understand a lot about HRT. You've got a lot of anxiety associated with it. And the doctors don't maybe don't understand um, the benefits as well as the risks of it. They, people tend to fo focus more on the risk factors associated with HRT um, rather than the benefits. And for myself the, and, and the people that understand about HRT is that there are far more benefits to it than there will ever be risks. But it depends what your individual risk factors are. That's the most important thing. And you make the decisions based offer your health needs and what you want to do. Thank you, Tammy. So just to recap then, it's about understanding what, what the menopause is. We've talked about that menopause is about hormone deficiencies. We've talked about HRT and the long-term effects of hormone um, deficiency um, and the reasons that HRT can help that because it can help with your symptoms, but it improves your long-term health as well. We've talked about our beliefs and our attitudes towards uh, menopause, aging and hormone replacement therapy. Um, and I can't read the last one, seeking help. Um, and it's about getting support from the right people to support you. So health professionals who specialise in menopause, GP, wellbeing teams, occupational health, etc., and also reputable sites. Thank you. So this is really what we're doing here with this presenta these presentations. We're giving twice monthly presentations on the different menopause topics. 
and it's really about offering um, support and getting discussions around menopause so that it's not a subject that we're sort of like um, walking away from, we're actually hitting it head on and getting everything out in the open. So we're doing question and answers next. We've, then we've got the menopause cafe. Any issues you have with menopause in the workplace, you need to be speaking to the people based at work. Next month's presentation, I'm gonna be talking about cancer and non-HRT treatments for menopause. So this, this session was based on about hormone replacement therapy for menopausal symptoms. Next month, it's going to be about the non-HRT treatments for it. Um, some websites there, though, um, there's the Black Country Healthcare NHS Trust. So there's that link there that you can find that information on. That's my website there, borntocare.co.uk. The one beneath it is the Women's Health Concern. It's a really good website. It's got lots and lots of information on there. You've got the British Menopause Society and you've got the NHS website there. Thank you.